Greetings, loves. It is I, Tactical Girlfriend. Welcome back to the channel. I hope everybody's doing well. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to camouflage your weapon system. Now, there's a lot of things that you may or may not want to do in this regard. There's a lot of reasons why you may want to get into this. These are just general concepts that I want to provide to you to use as a guideline, but take whatever you want from this video and use it and have fun. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, why exactly would you want to camouflage your weapon? Well, first of all, if you want to try to blend in with your surroundings, if you built your entire kit with certain colors and tones and camouflage patterns to do so, your weapon should also follow suit. There's no reason to ignore that. It will make you stand out like a sore thumb if you don't. Now, other people simply might want to camouflage their weapon because they're LARPers, and that's completely fine. I don't necessarily judge you for that. Just don't be cringe about it. Also, you simply just might want a fun arts and crafts project. Painting your gun is really, really fun in my experience, so I do kind of recommend that. Regardless, it's your weapon. You do whatever you want with it. Just have fun. Now, when it comes to approaching camouflage, I like to use the age-old reconnoitering acronym SILS. That stands for Stop, Look, Listen, and Smell. If you take all those senses into account into how you camouflage something, you're going to have a much more well-rounded and effective camouflage. Things like black rifles, for example, are just a big black silhouette. They generally don't blend in with anything at all. So consider painting your rifle something that matches the tonality and color of your environment better. Introduce patterns to help break it up so it's less of a silhouette. Try to cover up or obfuscate any reflective surfaces so you're not shining anything in a way that makes it easier for you to be detected. The second one is listening. If your weapon has any attachments to it that rattle, then you might want to try to cut down on that. It's going to add to the noise of your kit. Try to deaden everything that you can and make everything as quiet as possible. Lastly, we've got smell. This one might throw some people off. They might think, hey, my gun doesn't really smell like anything. Well, you're wrong. You're using all sorts of solvents and oils. You shoot it, it smells like gunpowder that has been used up and burned. All of that stuff may not feel very strong to you right now, but if you are spending a lot of time in the wilderness, your senses do reset, they become a lot sharper, and inorganic smells in particular become very easy to detect over a long distance. So consider that if that is something that might be concerned to you. Now first, I want to talk about painting your weapon. This is easily going to be the most effective and important form of camouflage that you can use on your weapon. It's going to take up the majority of this video for this reason. It's also probably the most labor-intensive approach, but it is also really fun and enjoyable in my experience, and once you do it, you don't really have to do it again. So first of all, you want to take inventory of your environment's colors. Make sure that you're matching colors to this with the paints that you're choosing and be very, very strategic about that. Secondly, we want to think about contrast. If you want to break up the outline of your weapon, you're probably going to want to introduce different colors and different tones on your weapon to further create patterns that break up the overall shape of your weapon. Thinking along the lines of tonality, you want to carefully consider the average tone of your environment. Think of it in terms of black and white and its relation to a 50% gray. If you're in a very light, sandy, bright, wide open desert, then you're probably going to be lighter than 50% gray. If you're in a deep, dark, densely populated forest, you're probably going to be darker than 50% gray. Use this to inform the ratio of dark to light tones that you use in your paint job and make sure that it's effectively matching your environment. Also, you want to carefully consider all the different kinds of colors that you're going to be using. You can get very in depth here and use six colors if you want to, get carried away, spend hours doing that paint job. You better like it if you do, but that can be a really nice and fun and effective way to camouflage your weapon. Still, you can also very effectively camouflage a weapon with only two colors so long as that there's a lot of tonal variation between the two. You want to make sure you got that contrast, but it's up to you with how simple and how complex you want to get. As far as paints go, Ervo, Krylon, Rust-Oleum all make really, really good camouflage paints. These are all flat finishes. They're not matte or glossy, which tend to be a bit more reflective. So make absolutely sure that you're getting an actual flat paint. Now first, before we get carried away with painting, we need to make sure that we're doing proper prep work. First of all, make sure that you got some proper PPE. Wear a mask or a respirator. Just make sure that you're not breathing in all those fumes. 
Furthermore, make sure that you're in a well-ventilated area. It's generally best to just do this outside if you can help it. If not, if you're indoors, make sure that you got plenty of good ventilation. Also, make sure that you're wearing gloves because you don't want to have paint on your hands and soak in weird chemicals through there. It's just not really recommended. Next, you want to consider how you're going to position your weapon when you're painting it. There's a number of ways to go about this, but first and foremost, you want to just make sure that you've got some sort of surface that you can put under it to catch the paint and make sure that you're not making a huge mess. Now, I personally opt to put my weapon on said surface and then just simply paint it and flip it over as necessary. You can opt to furthermore just hang it and suspend it in the air by some wires. That's perfectly legitimate. It's very pro of you, but personally, I don't really have any problem laying it flat. I have not had any issues either way whatsoever, so choose whatever works best for you. Next, you're going to want to prep the surfaces for painting. You're going to want to degrease your weapon, make sure that there's no oil or any dirt that is accumulated on the gun, further allowing the paint to actually come in full contact with the surface and stick to it. Now, you can use things like naphtha, you can use alcohol, brake cleaner, it doesn't matter so long as it doesn't leave a film behind and dissolves and evaporates effectively, it should work just fine. Also, you don't need a primer. No, these paints actually stick to the gun really well. They will wear over time, but that's just simply the nature of using a gun, so don't worry about the primer. As long as you're using these flat camouflage paints that I generally recommend, you should be good. Next, you want to cover up anything that you don't want to paint on your weapon with masking tape. This also includes any seams to prevent anything in the internals from getting paint caught on that. On an AR, for example, I like to put some tape on the interior around the ejection port so that nothing comes through there. Generally, all these surfaces should be pretty tight and the tolerances should prevent anything from happening, but it's better safe than sorry. Also, I like to take the bolt carrier group out on ARs. I like to put masking tape on my iron sight posts, any essential markings, any glass, any emitters. And if you're going to use a suppressor, make sure that you cover up your muzzle device so that it mates very cleanly and evenly with said suppressor. Otherwise, you might have some fitment issues. Now, if you want to be super meticulous, you can disassemble your gun completely, take off any components that you don't want to paint, cover up any of the holes so that you make sure that paint doesn't get in through those where the parts have been removed. That's all well and good. I personally haven't really had an issue. Things like fire selectors that do move around can get painted over no problem. If you use them, it just wears the paint off pretty quickly. I've never had an issue with that. I keep my charging handles on my ARs when I paint them. I've never really had a problem here. But that is something that you may personally want to consider. Also, if you do paint over a logo in attempts to prevent it from being painted over, God kills a kitten every single time, so please don't do that. Another thing you might want to consider is painting your magazines as well. With an AR, you can get a nice Magpul mag. Those things take paint very well. I've seen excellent results with those, but basically any magazine out there you can totally paint no problem. Now you can stick the mag into the mag wall of the gun while you paint it and simultaneously paint the magazine. That way you are covering up your mag well and preventing any paint from getting in there. Otherwise, if you didn't, you would definitely need to make sure that that is completely obfuscated. So again, that you don't get paint into the action. Either way, when you paint a magazine, just make sure that you are not painting any of the surface that does sit in the mag well. Otherwise, you will have fitment issues. So if you are painting magazines separately, just make sure that you mask them off appropriately. And finally, let's start painting the gun. Make sure that you're starting with the lightest color that you have in your palette. Whatever is tonally the lightest needs to be your base coat. From here, all the darker colors will layer on, even if that light color does look a little out of place at first, because it will. It doesn't matter, it is a very key component in getting proper tonal variation. Generally, I like to start out with some sort of sandy tan. When using spray paint, I generally recommend holding the can about 10 to 12 inches away from the surface as you paint. Make sure that you're doing nice and even short strokes. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you do want to have an overall fairly even application of the paint. Furthermore, don't apply too much paint in one area or apply too close because you will start to get a glossy effect and that defeats the entire purpose. Once you've got your light base coat down, you're then going to move to probably the second lightest color in your inventory. Personally, in this case, I used a light green and I tried to create a chevron pattern that's about four fingers wide. Basically, the idea here is that in this chevron, I am effectively breaking up the pattern of the rifle by making contrasting lines that go in different directions. 
You can also go parallel if you want for more tiger stripe effects. Honestly, it probably doesn't really matter that much, but I do kind of think that the chevron is gonna give you the best results in terms of camouflage. Essentially in this phase, we're creating a macro pattern that is to obfuscate the overall shape and break it up when viewed from a long distance. In this next phase, we're going to create a micro pattern. We're gonna use stencils to create finer tonal variations to further break up the pattern of the weapon when viewed from a closer distance. Moving on from there, I wanted to further darken those chevrons, so I used a darker green to overlay on the same lighter green chevrons, while also using a cedar branch as a stencil to introduce a little bit of randomness and some more organic shapes in those said chevrons. I generally tried to keep the light tan alone. That is going to be addressed in the next step. Finally, I'm going to use the darkest color in my palette, and that's a really nice dark brown. I'm also going to use this as a stencil in tandem with a mesh laundry bag. Basically, these laundry bags are really effective at developing a really good stencil for micro patterns. They're generally circular or hexagonal, and they're also really cheap and you can source them very easily. Wrapping the mesh laundry bag tightly around the weapon, I'm then going to apply some dark brown interspersed among the tan regions. This is to further add more tonal variation, so make sure that you're not completely painting over the lighter colors, otherwise you're going to completely lose that tonality and you're going to have less contrast. Remember, less is more here. You can always add more paint, but you can't really take it away. You can always start over if you need to. This stuff is pretty forgiving, but why waste your time when you can just do it right the first time? Generally, I recommend just applying a little bit of paint, seeing how you feel about it, and then going from there. Take your time, don't rush it, you'll thank yourself later. Finally, when you're done painting and the weapon is dried, go and lay it somewhere in your natural environment, take some step back, and just look at it from different ranges and see how effective the camo job is. It should blend in pretty well at different ranges. If it's not, then you may want to actually make some changes, make some adjustments. You can always add more paint whenever you need to. Finally, when you're certain that you're actually done, take off the masking tape, inspect the action, make sure that no paint got inside, and just run a general functions check. Congratulations, you're done, enjoy. Also some general pointers for painting. If you are in a really big rush, you can use a hairdryer to expedite the drying process. Personally, I don't think it's really that necessary. These paints generally dry to the touch in about five minutes. Um, furthermore, if you put too much heat on it, it could actually crack the finish and that's not gonna look really great for at least a fresh coat of paint. So I generally do recommend that you just kind of let it sit and do its thing. Now, you also might be really sensitive about the integrity of your paint job and you don't want to mess up any of the finish or mar anything. That's perfectly understandable. You did put a lot of effort and time into this probably, so I generally recommend waiting about a week until you take your gun to the range. Personally, I would shoot it in a day and not worry about it, but I also just don't care if it gets worn in because that's just kind of part of the experience in the process. But that is another consideration. On that note, don't be afraid to break in the finish of your gun. Your gun is a tool, it's meant to be used, and it should also show signs of use. This is a purely utilitarian process. There's gonna be flakes of finish that just fall off over time through use, and that's perfectly okay. In fact, it looks really cool, and it adds to the overall tonal variation and contrast of your gun. Now, if you battle wear your rifle intentionally, that's cringe, don't do that. Also, as you use your weapon, UV radiation from the sun is gonna fade some of that finish. You're gonna get dirt that also alters the tone and color of your finish, and that's all gonna help you blend in even better with your environment. It's gonna age like a fine wine, so don't keep it in the safe. Get out there and don't be afraid to get it dirty. Now, going back to our sills example, there are still other things that you can do beyond painting to further camouflage your weapon. If you are shooting from a static position and you are very worried about concealment, you can go the extra mile and add foliage or burlap to your gun to further obfuscate the overall outline of it. That may not apply to a lot of people, but it might apply to you, so that is something to consider. Also, you want to cut down on reflective surfaces, so if you've got any optics, you might want to consider putting a kill flash at the end. Those can be very reflective. Furthermore, even more so, the weapon lights. They're giant mirrors basically on the end, so getting something like an optics bikini cover and simply cutting that and taping it to the end of your weapon light can do a lot. Moving on in sills, we also have listen. So use your weapon, run around with it, use it in your kit and see what makes noise. Try to cut that down as much as you can. 
Generally, sling swivels are gonna be with some of the noisiest things that rattle when your sling moves. So I like to put elastic belt keepers on these and that really helps deaden them. Anything else that rattles or moves around pretty easily, just try to secure it as best as you can. Last but not least, again, smell. If you got any concerns around your weapon smelling inorganic and being pretty pungent and detectable in nature, that is definitely a consideration. Make sure that you're cleaning your gun regularly so it doesn't smell like gunpowder, and also make sure that whatever you're using to clean it also doesn't smell strongly of anything. Get a nice neutral CLP or something of that sort. And that wraps up my camo seminar. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell too. Furthermore, if you got your own ideas around camo or comments on my methods, I'd love to hear more about it. So let's get chatting in the comments below. I also want to graciously thank every single person who has ever contributed to this channel on Patreon. I don't run YouTube ads on this channel. I hate them. I'm sure you hate them too. So the bulk of my support does come from viewers like you. If you want to go help chip in, you can always go to patreon.com slash tacticalgf. The biggest contributors are named at the end of the video. And that's a wrap. I really appreciate you all tuning in. Please be good to each other out there. And as always, please take care. Bye!